The, whole, the total crew, I'm going to thank Joe Himes and Marco Bala and everybody who nurtured this film, the whole marketing department at uh, Warner Brothers. The person who bears the name Clint Eastwood has been in the icon stage of his Hollywood stardom for some time now. The name Clint Eastwood has become a household name. In May of 2023, he celebrated his 93rd birthday, and he is able to boast of success in front of and behind the camera throughout his career which began in the 1950s and continues up to the present day. Eastwood's work has been both controversial and well-liked throughout his career, beginning with his early days as an actor and including his breakthrough roles, and continuing with his more recent acclaim as an Oscar-winning film director. Without a doubt, he has amassed a filmography that is extremely powerful and impressive. In Hollywood, the well-known actor had to overcome a number of obstacles, but he quickly established himself as a name that deserves to be remembered. Who exactly is Clint Eastwood, and what kind of legacy does he come from? We invite you to join us as we uncover the life of Clint Eastwood, who, at the age of 93, finally admits what we had all already suspected. Clint Eastwood is a legendary actor-director and film producer. Ruth Sonier and Clinton Eastwood Sonier welcomed their son into the world on May 31, 1930 at St. Francis Memorial Hospital in San Francisco. He went on to become a legendary actor. Ruth was known by the surname of her second husband, John Belden Wood, during the time that her son was famous. She married John Belden Wood after Clinton Sr. passed away to become her second husband. On account of the fact that Eastwood weighed 11 pounds and 6 ounces at birth, the nurses at the hospital gave him the nickname Samson when he was born. His younger sister, Jean Bernhardt, is the younger of the two children that he is connected to. Blood from the United Kingdom, Ireland, Scotland, and the Netherlands run through his veins. It is through this line that he is the twelfth generation of people to be born in North America. His ancestry can be traced back to William Bradford, a passenger on the Mayflower. Throughout the 1930s, his family moved three times due to the fact that his father became employed in different fields. On the other hand, contrary to what Eastwood has stated in their interviews with the media, they did not relocate between the years 1940 and 1949. Following their relocation to Piedmont, California, the Eastwood family established themselves in a prosperous neighborhood of the town. They owned a swimming pool, were members of a country club, and each parent drove their own vehicle. The majority of Eastwood's father's working life was spent at Georgia Pacific, where he held the position of manufacturing executive. Ruth settled down at IBM, where she worked as a secretary. As Clinton Jean grew older, Eastwood went to Piedmont Middle School, but he was not allowed to further his education because of his poor academic performance. According to his records, he was also required to attend summer school. He attended Piedmont High School from January 1945 until at least January 1946, but he was asked to leave because, in addition to other school infractions, he wrote an offensive suggestion to a school official on the scoreboard of the athletic field and burned an effigy on the school lawn. After transferring to Oakland Technical High School, he was supposed to graduate in the middle of the year in January 1949. However, it is not entirely clear whether he actually did graduate. It has been brought to the attention of the biographer Patrick McGilligan that the records of high school graduation are a matter of strict legal confidentiality. Before deciding whether or not to be interviewed, Eastwood's school principal was required to make a call to his management, as stated by the author. The person who answered the phone at Malpaso advised him not to speak to me, but he did not take their advice. Even though the life of the legendary actor has been filled with a roller coaster of events and a series of highs and lows, he continues to be an inspiration to a great number of people. To be more specific, how did he come to be so well known? The military service was unforgettable. The renowned and well known actor served in a variety of roles outside of the screen. Additionally, he had served in the military prior to that. It was during the Korean War that Eastwood was drafted into the military in the year 1951. In the city of Fort Ord, California, he worked as a swimming instructor. He was a passenger on a Navy AD-1Q torpedo bomber that experienced engine problems and crashed off the coast of California near Point Reyes, which is not too far from San Francisco. Both he and the pilot made their way to the shore in the icy water which was two miles away. This real-life event served as a precursor to his role as Frank Morris in the film Escape from Alcatraz, which was released in 1979. In the film, he and two other men escape the penitentiary that is located on Alcatraz Island by swimming away in the waters of San Francisco Bay, which are extremely cold. During the year 1953, 
Eastwood was discharged from the military with his honor. It was a difficult path to stardom. In the course of his pursuit of a career in the entertainment industry, Clint Eastwood encountered a great deal of difficulty, which made his path to stardom anything but smooth. When he entered the world of acting for the first time, he had a difficult time securing roles and gaining recognition. Following his discharge from the military, he began his career as a lifeguard on the beach. However, his aspirations eventually led him to pursue other opportunities. After completing his studies at the department in Los Angeles, the young man went on to conquer the big city and enroll in college there. At the same time, he did some part-time work in order to have something that he could rely on. By day, he worked as a manager in a house in Beverly Hills where he rented a flat, and by night, he worked at a gas station. He was able to maintain both jobs simultaneously. Clint made the decision to begin his acting training after receiving recommendations from his friends from the military. After some time had passed, he recalled that he had been completely blown away by arguments that some actresses were the most beautiful girls in the world. Additionally, during this time, Clint participated in a number of auditions, participated in self-produced theatrical performances, attempted to write scripts, and harassed film companies in the hopes of signing a contract with one of them. Irvin Glassberg, a cinematographer working for Universal Studios, was the first person Clint met. At the gas station, he extended an invitation to the young man to accompany him to a meeting with director Arthur Lubin. The future star benefited from having a stunning appearance and a rapid growth rate. In spite of the fact that he had very little acting experience, he was able to pass the screen tests and sign a contract with the studio. On the other hand, the director did not have the most favorable impression of the relationship. According to the director, he exhibited a high level of inexperience. In addition to not knowing how to turn or where to go, he was also clueless about what to do. Because of this, the most important requirement for signing the contract was to take acting classes. A modest payment of $100 per week was also offered to Clint, although some sources claim that it was only $75. Despite this, it was sufficient for him to relocate to a new apartment that was located closer to the studio. In addition to the young man, the house was occupied by other aspiring Hollywood actors, which allowed him to make new friends and acquaintances. A similar lack of success was experienced during the initial gathering with the other members of the studio staff. It was a test that Clint had to pass, and it required him to repeat the monologue that Alan Squire had delivered in the film Petrified Forest, which was released in 1936. Additionally, in one of the scenes, he had to strip naked in front of everybody. One of the employees at the studio recalled him while describing him as having the appearance of a typical hillbilly. He was thin, rural, and a man who spoke very little and moved very slowly. It was the young actor's appearance that was the source of the problem. Although he was too handsome for a character role, he was not particularly handsome enough to play a romantic hero in films starring women. It was common practice for the studio to employ boys like Clint in order to fill the space on the screening screen. After they allowed him to watch the tape of the audition, he came to the conclusion that he did not have a very good appearance. In addition to a lack of experience, Eastwood's work was negatively impacted by his poor reputation within the studio. It was in low-budget films with low honorariums that he was cast in supporting roles. Among them were films such as Away All Boats in 1956, Revenge of the Creature, Francis in the Navy, and Tarantula, all of which were released in 1955. Due to the fact that the roles were so small, the actors had absolutely no lines to say. Consequently, Clint played the part of an unnamed laboratory assistant in the movie Revenge of the Creature. This assistant miraculously found a rat that had been missing for some time. On the other hand, in the movie Tarantula, he played the role of an Air Force pilot who was tasked with eliminating a gigantic insect. There was only a half minute of screen time allotted to him in the drama Never Say Goodbye, which was released in 1956. Eastwood was able to star in eight different projects in just two years, despite the fact that his career was plagued by a run of bad luck. By that time, the actor had already demonstrated his strengths, which included a wonderful sense of humor and an incredible influence on women, both of which he would later put to use in his career. However, up until this point, Clint has been unable to successfully transfer those qualities to his characters. In order to correct a feature, Eastwood sought the assistance of a speech defect specialist. He whispered his words in a whistling manner. In spite of the efforts that were made, it was not possible to correct the defect.
However, as time passes, it will eventually become a characteristic of the actor. Moreover, Jack Coslin and Jess Kimmel were the instructors that Clint utilized for his acting training. The first success was achieved as a result of the efforts. After being brought to people's attention, the individual started getting offers for leading roles in movies. In the film industry, Clint became a popular choice for the role of a positive hero in Westerns due to his attractiveness and impressiveness. Ambush at Cimarron Pass, which was released in 1958, featured Keith Williams as one of the actors. After being attacked by the Indians, the film was an adventure movie that told the story of a group of cowboys and soldiers who worked together to protect themselves. Clint appeared to be very dissatisfied with the outcome. According to what he said in an interview in 1978, the film was so terrible that I couldn't help but sink lower and lower in my seat. This was in light of the fact that it was one of the worst westerns ever made. The subsequent film, The First Traveling Sales Lady, was a collaboration between him and Carol Channing and he had high hopes for its success. However, it was not successful at the box office. His performance in the film Lafayette Escadrille, which was released in 1958, was merely of a supporting nature. Afterwards, Clint recalled that they were producing a great deal of low-quality material, also known as B-movies. There was never a time when I did not play a young lieutenant or a laboratory assistant, because he received offers for lead roles so infrequently the actor started to lose hope that his future would be better. In addition, my time spent working with the studio was brief. After a year and a half, Universal decided to terminate the contract that they had with him. It was argued by the film studio executives that Clint had the wrong appearance. His teeth and Adam's apple were two aspects of his appearance that the producers did not like. It was something that Eastwood was not ready for. However, there was nothing that he could do, so he was forced to continue going to auditions, working out at the gym, and learning how to act. Despite the fact that Eastwood had finally landed his long-awaited lead role, the film turned out to be a low-budget western that was so terrible that he decided to leave the project. The young man worked in low-paying jobs in order to make money. He worked as a cleaner at a furniture factory in addition to digging pits for swimming pools. It was a fortunate accident that saved him. While visiting a friend at the studio of the CBS television network, Clint had the opportunity to participate in a meeting with one of the directors of the Rawhide series. In order to fill the supporting role of cowboy Rowdy Yates, he was looking for a young man who was suitable for the part. Rowdy outlined the roles that the actor would play in the years to come. A lovely and admirable person who is a person of principle and who stays true to those principles. Clint stated that he did not find such a character to be particularly interesting by any means. However, the executives of the television network found a new star for themselves from the very first episodes of the show. It was Clint who introduced a fresh cultural element to the show. As a result of his strength, attractiveness, roughness, and proficiency in shooting and fighting, he immediately captivated a young audience for the series. At a later point in time, the actor fondly recalled that time period. Over the course of seven years, from the very first episode to the very last, Clint was the host of the series. He had doubled his salary to $600 by the time the first season came to a close. In addition, by the time the series was over, there were already six numbers. The actor's life was profoundly impacted by the series despite the fact that it did not achieve widespread popularity. During his time there, Clint initiated his interest in directing and started gaining an understanding of the film industry from the inside. Young Eastwood was extended an invitation to film one of the episodes, but unfortunately, the opportunity was never taken advantage of. As a result of the actor's contract with CBS, he was not permitted to take part in any projects that were produced by third parties. It was not until 1953 that the network began to relax its control, which occurred a little after the fourth season of the series started to gradually decline in popularity. As a means of promoting him, the executives made the decision to use their main actor, Clint, in another capacity. An episode of the popular sitcom Mr. Ed, in which the actor played himself, was one of the episodes that the company requested the actor to appear in as a guest star. On the condition that he would not wear cowboy clothes, he agreed to the terms of the agreement. However, Eastwood was not counting on being able to use this as an advertisement. The episode that featured the talking horse was just as peculiar as the rest of the episodes on the show. On the other hand, he proudly passed the test 
and then quietly accepted the money. Ahead of Clint was where the true success was waiting for him. In addition, he was once again connected to the cowboy films that were shown in theaters. The works that he produced in the decades that followed would eventually give rise to a singular image of a laconic hero in westerns and action films. During the production of Rawhide, the Italian director Sergio Leone took notice of the actor. He extended an invitation to Clint to participate in his latest endeavor, A Fistful of Dollars, which was conceived as a response to Akira Kurosawa's Yojimbo and evolved into the first installment of the renowned Dollar Trilogy. Leone was looking for a man with a lot of texture to play the lead role, and she loved Eastwood. Eli Wallach and Lee Van Cleef were supposed to be his co-stars in the filming of the project. Clint was so repulsed by the proposition of playing the role of the good guy from Rawhide that he agreed to accept Leone's offer. In spite of the fact that the shooting had to take place in Italy and Spain with both countries, it was also necessary for him to work on the series. Many years later, director Sergio Leone remarked that the only reason he gave Clint the go-ahead to play the lead role in his films was because the actor possessed two facial expressions that were appropriate for the role, both while wearing a hat and without one. The director was taken aback by the slowly moving manner in which the actor performed. Throughout the entirety of the production of the trilogy, the actor wore the same poncho throughout the entire process, and throughout that time, he refused to let anyone wash it. His use of it was similar to that of a talisman. A Fistful of Dollars was the first movie ever made, and it was released in 1964. The movie was a huge hit in Europe and the United States of America, despite the fact that it was subject to allegations of plagiarism in Asian countries. Despite having a budget of $200,000, it was able to earn $14 million and helped to establish a subgenre known as Spaghetti Western. Around the same time, Clint became famous for the first time. As a result, it should not come as a surprise that they produced two sequels a few years later, for a few dollars more in 1965 and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly in 1966. The figure of the protagonist served as a unifying presence across all three films, while wearing a poncho, cowboy boots, a cigarillo in his mouth, and a morality that is questionable, he remained silent. The melody that serves as the film's primary motivation is widely regarded as one of the most recognizable melodies in the history of cinema. The actor's life was drastically altered as a result of this experience. A lawsuit was filed against Leone in the future because the film was so similar to the source material. It should come as no surprise that the correlation between the details is so strikingly accurate. An image of a solitary warrior, a montage rhythm and structure of action that is comparable to the previous one. As a result, fights start with a lengthy and tense wait, during which the camera focuses on every movement and look of the competitors. By the way, Kurosawa prevailed in the court case, and as a result, he was awarded $100,000 and 15% of the box office. However, the effort was well worth it. It was Sergio Leone and Clint Eastwood who made a significant contribution to the image of the Western genre, which had been on the verge of extinction by the early 1960s. They came up with the concept of a traditional Puritan hero who wears a hat and rides a horse. This hero is a complex of unambiguous positive qualities and well-established cultural cliches. There are a few different names that are suggested for Eastwood's character by other characters throughout the course of the trilogy. As a result, he is referred to as the man who does not have a name in the movie. Empire Magazine ranked him as the 43rd greatest cinematic character of all time in the year 2008. While this was going on, his private life was in a state of active instability. Eastwood has always been able to attract the attention of a large number of women due to his height and physique, and he did not pass up the opportunity to make use of this. When he was mentioned in the media, the word womanizer was always used in conjunction with his name. When viewed from a different angle, Clint Eastwood has garnered a notorious reputation due to the fact that he has been involved in a number of relationships throughout his life. These relationships have been the focus of interest and scrutiny. Throughout his romantic life, he has been involved in a number of significant affairs and has fathered children with a variety of different women. There was a lot of controversy surrounding the director. When he first walked down the aisle to marry Maggie Jones in 1953, the legendary actor hadn't even reached the age of 23 yet. 
During the time that Eastwood was subsequently able to achieve fame and fortune in Hollywood, there are reports that indicate that he was not a faithful husband. In point of fact, Eastwood did admit to a biographer that he was still seeing other women during the time that he was dating the woman who would eventually become his wife. There was another woman that Eastwood was involved with prior to his marriage to Maggie Johnson, who would later become his first wife. Eastwood's biographer, Patrick McGilligan, claims that after he moved to Seattle, the film actor-director began a romantic relationship with a young woman who remained nameless following his departure. He succeeded in getting her pregnant, but the child they had together, a girl, was placed for adoption. In 2018, during the premiere of Eastwood's film The Mule, their daughter was finally revealed to the public for the first time. Lori Murray was adopted by Clyde and Helen Warren of Seattle, Washington, after she was born on February 11, 1954. Lowell Thomas Murray IV, the biological grandmother of Eastwood's son, claims that his biological grandmother never informed him that she was pregnant and that she never communicated with him after the affair. The revelation that Eastwood was Lori's biological father came as a complete surprise to Lori when she started researching her biological parents. On the other hand, if you believe that the young woman who remained nameless was the only affair that Eastwood had while he was married to Johnson, then you are completely mistaken. Between the years 1959 and 1959, during the second season of Rawhide, Clint Eastwood began a long-term affair with Roxanne Tunis, a stunt woman and actress who was married at the time but had separated from her husband. The couple welcomed a daughter, Kimber, in 1964. However, her existence was not revealed to either Eastwood or the general public until July 1989, when the National Enquirer disclosed her identity. Allegedly, Eastwood's co-workers were aware of the baby, which caused a great deal of excitement and speculation regarding this affair. In addition, actress Barbara Eden, who had previously appeared as a guest on Rawhide, made the observation that Eastwood and Johnson were somewhat in an open marriage. This brought to light the fact that Eastwood had earlier stated in an interview with reporter Tim Chadwick in 1971 that they do not believe in being together. During the production of the outlaw Josie Wales in Page, Arizona, Eastwood began living with actress Sandra Locke. This occurred while he was still married to Johnson and after the affair with Tunis had finally come to an end. They were both married at the time, but they did not have a relationship with one another. Even further, it was reported that Eastwood stated that there was no longer any connection between him and Johnson. On the other hand, Locke was married to her best friend who was openly Gordon Anderson. However, the marriage was a marriage of convenience that was never consummated. The two of them lived lives that were like two pieces of a puzzle that fit together in an odd way. In spite of the fact that he had never been able to have a relationship with a single woman, Eastwood admitted to Locke that he was surprised by his need for her. She Made Me Monogamous is the name of the song that the actor made about the situation, which he also made up without any shame. Even though he was rumored to have been in a relationship with Tunis for 14 years, this was in no way comparable to his previous relationships. Despite the fact that they did not have any children, the couple had two abortions, and Locke underwent to ball legation in the late 1970s at the same time. The unsettling aspect is that Eastwood was still secretly maintaining several maintenance relationships even while they were living together. This is something that is very concerning. It should come as no surprise that their relationship gradually deteriorated after Eastwood had finally divorced Johnson, but Locke continued to be married to Anderson. If Eastwood had agreed to participate in couples therapy with her, Locke claims that she would have been willing to divorce Anderson. However, he did not agree to participate in the therapy. During the ugly breakup that occurred in 1989, Locke filed a lawsuit against Eastwood for palimony. The lawsuit was filed after Locke claimed that Eastwood had changed the locks on their home and removed all of her belongings. Despite the fact that they reached a settlement, she obviously did not have enough money because she filed a lawsuit for fraud once more in 1995, which they settled out of court. Clint Eastwood had an affair with flight attendant Jocelyn Reeves while he was maintaining his relationship with Sandra Locke. As a result of this affair, he became the father of two children, Scott in 1986 and Catherine in 1988. In 1990, the affair was brought to the attention of the public by the star tabloid. During the same time period, 
Eastwood started a romantic relationship with Frances Fisher, an actress whom he had discovered while working on the set of Pink Cadillac. The year 1993 saw the birth of their daughter, Francesca, but the year 1995 marked the end of their relationship. During the time that he was directing American Sniper, Eastwood was also involved in political controversy. Eastwood maintained that the film was a portrayal of the realities that soldiers face without any political bias, despite the fact that some critics accused the film of glorifying war. In addition, Eastwood was subjected to public scrutiny for what was perceived to be his support of Donald Trump. However, in the year 2020, he clarified that he was actually supporting Michael Bloomberg. His political views have frequently been misunderstood, which has frequently resulted in confusion and debate. In the book titled Clint, The Life and Legend, written by Patrick McGilligan, Clint Eastwood is portrayed as a figure who has a strong desire to exert control over others and frequently goes to great lengths in order to preserve his position of authority. His reputation for terminating contracts with employees who challenged his control is well documented. In fact, one producer even made the remark that a gathering of those whom Eastwood had wronged would have to take place in the Los Angeles Coliseum. Eastwood, in spite of this portrayal, refuted such claims in an interview with CBS. He stated that he valued collaboration and did not seek total control, citing his work on Million Dollar Baby as an example. When Eastwood was serving in the Army, he had the opportunity to purchase land in Carmel, California, which was the beginning of his real estate endeavors. A number of significant properties, such as the 283-acre Malpaso land, which he eventually sold to Monterey County, and the 134-acre Odello Ranch were among the properties that he acquired over the course of his life. Additionally, he contributed to charitable causes by donating land to the Big Sur Land Trust and supporting flood control measures in the vicinity of his resort, Mission Ranch. Homes in Carmel, Bel Air, Sun Valley, and Hawaii are among the properties that are included in his impressive real estate portfolio. The fact that Eastwood's real estate holdings span multiple states and luxurious properties is a reflection of his success in both the business world and the entertainment industry. Eastwood's career as an actor and businessman has brought him an enormous amount of wealth. By clicking on the link that is currently displayed on your screen, you will be able to view yet another video that is very interesting. We will meet again on the other side.